Now, this is a really interesting topic, obviously, and uh, you know there has been a lot of talk, especially over the last two years, about autonomous vehicles uh, in the press and the media everywhere. Some of the stuff that's really, really far out almost reminds me of you know having flying cars, and then probably a little bit more realistic stuff that talks about how we can really get to that next level. I just got here from LA, from the LA Auto Show. I just drove up here, and I certainly could have liked the, would have liked the idea of pushing a button at certain stretches on, on Highway 5, which you probably all know, to have the car drive itself. But that's just one example, of course, of self-driving vehicles. What if in the future you don't have to drop off your kids at school anymore? The car could do that for you. What if uh, maybe going forward mobile commerce will be redefined? Maybe mobile commerce means actually going forward that Best Buy invites you on a shopping spree by sending you a car, pick you up, and drive you to the store, and drive you back home. Or think about it, your lovely mother-in-law, who is 80 and can't really come that often anymore to visit you. Now she can, because now she has a car to come and visit you every weekend. Beautiful, right? So there will be interesting scenarios of this. Let me just uh, talk a little bit about uh, Gartner, for those of you that are not familiar, really briefly. Um, we are the largest technology advisory company in the world. We have 1,500, almost 1,500 analysts, experts that focus on specific technologies or industries, in my case, automotive. Um, which is a pretty big pre uh, practice for Gartner. We operate in 85 countries around the world. So we talk to a lot of companies, government agencies, anyone who's interested in technologies. And that number of companies that we talk to, organizations, distinct organizations, is 13,000. So a pretty large number of companies, again, that we talk to. What do we do? We predict the future. We tell people what's going to happen. And I'm very proud of having a very, very good track record of doing the right things. We develop winning strategies on the technology and business side for companies understanding how they have to prepare for these new trends that we're predicting. And of course, to help companies to discover new opportunities. And we will certainly talk about new opportunities here tonight. A little bit about myself without going into too much detail. 16 years ago, I founded the automotive practice for Gartner, which didn't really exist back then. And I did this actually with a vision that I had in mind that cars will completely change based on technology, based on IT. And not just the cars, but also the processes that the automotive industry is using and the, the experiences, the value propositions that are tied into the car. And that would also mean that you have different ecosystems of companies coming together to create new automotive or mobility-centric value propositions going forward. And as Tom pointed out, that's what led me to actually found Gartner's Automotive Practice in Silicon Valley. And back then, a lot of people accused me of doing this here in Silicon Valley just because of the sun and the nice weather. Wasn't quite the case, though. And nowadays, pretty much everybody is here. Connected vehicle. That's how we look at autonomous vehicles as a functional area, innovation area. And I just want to share that briefly with you just to organize this in a certain context. So when we talk about the connected vehicle, we differentiate between four of these innovation areas. Telematics, infotainment, ADAS, which stands for Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, and mobility innovations. And autonomous or self-driving cars really fit into those two last categories. And again, we will, we'll talk about certain aspects today. We can't cover it all, but certainly we'll hit on the most important ones. Now, when we talk about self-driving vehicles, again, just to help you frame this topic a little bit better, we actually see three faces. And there are different ways of how companies are looking at this, or even government agencies. But we came up with this a couple of years ago, and we feel pretty comfortable. At the first evolution of this, we really talk about automated vehicles, cars that can do certain functions in an automated fashion. And to some extent, that already exists today. Think about dynamic cruise control, for example, which I got in a car the first time 12 years ago, which is pretty amazing. It has been around for quite some time. Then we actually get to the autonomous vehicle side. That means really you can have a car drive and operate multiple functions at a given time. You just enter the address and it just goes off, but you still have to be there in case something goes wrong. And I'm simplifying, of course. And then ultimately, the unmanned or drone vehicle, if you will. That's the robot idea. Having a car driving around doing things on your behalf. You don't go shopping anymore. Again, you have the car going to pick up your grocery bags at Safeway. Now, I mentioned earlier that we do a lot of predictions. So my prediction that I had with regards to specifically the autonomous car is the following one. And this is from November last year, when we first published this, actually. And you can see here, I predict by 2016 that there will be three companies they will have announced concrete plans for launching autonomous vehicles in the future. 2016, three years from now, three companies will do this. And, and mind you, I'm not saying auto manufacturers, I say companies. 
And of course, we all know who that other company could be in there together with the auto manufacturers. But we'll talk about this. Who will be those companies? Actually, we may have some companies here that will launch even before that. Why is this important to kind of understand the timing for all of this? Well, you know, consumers really like the idea of having a self-driving vehicle. And before I actually share with you a data point from one of our studies that we did in the past, just maybe by, by show of hands, how many of you would actually like the concept of an autonomous car that can really drive itself, completely drive itself? Look at that. What are we waiting for, guys? Come on, bring, the, bring it. People are ready. Well, interesting, this crowd here, I'm not surprising, I guess, based on the topic that we chose, um, seems to be very, very into this. Now, the good news, though, is in the US, when we ask this to drivers, vehicle owners, 30% of all vehicle owners in the US say, yep, I want that in my next new car, 30%. So you could argue, well, that means 70% aren't ready yet. True, but you have to keep in mind, most people haven't really experienced this yet. And to get already 30% for a technology that nobody has experienced is really, really high. So I think the market is quite ready for this, and we'll see how this will actually unfold. So what are some of the benefits of self-driving vehicles? Again, I won't talk to all of those, but of course the big one here is reduced accidents. And it would be great if we can save lives or, or minimize the number of injuries that we have. Maybe you have more personal time if you're not stuck in traffic. Or you will actually have crime prevention because now if you do something bad, guess what? The car drives you to jail going forward, <laughs> right? You can't get out if you're really bad. And, and you think that might be far-fetched, but it really isn't. OnStar, for example, General Motors telematics technology can actually slow down the vehicle and lock it up if somebody steals it. So that already exists today, right? So it's not really that far-fetched. Um, but you may also have very um, good things for society, improved uh, productivity for all of us, we better use, or better ut uh, road utilization or even traffic improvements that we can see. Maybe even fleet operations will be improved, which is all good stuff. We all need this, obviously, for various reasons. Again, I won't talk to all of those things, but I do believe that this will ultimately also lead to new innovation and business model opportunities. Somebody will make money with this, and it might not just be the car manufacturers going forward. It might be other companies uh, that will benefit from this as well. And of course, there are plenty of challenges. Again, I won't talk too much about all of these, but trust is a big one. How do you trust the machine to really take care of you when it drives itself? And I always talk about the 30 seconds kind of trust um, time that it takes for an autonomous vehicle. The first time I sat in one and it drove on the highway, it took me a couple of seconds to really feel comfortable looking around like, oh yeah, this, this works, and the steering wheel going like this. And the best thing was that somebody was trying to cut us off. And the car actually kind of casually backed up to let the guy actually let us cut, cut us off. And the reason it could do that is because obviously it has sensors in the vehicle that can always monitor what's going on around them. I can't do that as a human. So I think the trust factor is an important one, but I think consumers will get over this fairly quickly. Another concern that I have is unrealistic expectations. Consumers might think that the self-driving vehicle going forward can do all of these things that I talked about earlier. That might not happen necessarily right away. It will take some time. And again, I won't talk too much about this. Um, threat to existing business models is probably an, an interesting one. I love driving a car. That's where I drove from LA back to the Bay Area instead of flying. It's fun for me to do that. What if going forward, self-driving cars will be regulated in a way that I can't really choose how fast I go or when I pass up another vehicle? That would be the downside of it. And that could um, lead to a loss of driving freedom if you think about it. Most consumers may not care about this, but there are some of us out there that do, and I know some of you in the audience are similar to me in that respect. Why is this important from a business model perspective if you think about passenger vehicles? Well, if you have a car that can drive itself, you can do all kinds of other things in a vehicle, and the driver and the occupants in the car become a captive audience. And what that actually means is that on average in the United States, based on your Census uh, Bureau data, we spend about 48 minutes per day in the vehicle. So that's a captive audience of 48 minutes every day just to commute to work and back. And that's really captive. It's different than sitting on a sofa at home where when commercials come on, you just get up to the kitchen and, and you just ignore it. In the car, you can't really do that. So a captive audience in an automotive autonomous vehicle context really has a different meaning. My final thought on this, and this relates to how going forward some of these business models will change, self-driving vehicles in my eyes will really lead to disruptive business models going forward. And I could even imagine that in the future you might see something like this, where you might get a free car, or at least free transportation, based on 
another business model that you're supporting by doing this. In this case, maybe you sign up for a lifetime data contract with a carrier. And lifetime could mean different things. It doesn't really mean like shackles for the entire rest of your life. It could mean maybe 15 years, 20 years, whatever it is. And you're not going to get a Rolls Royce or Mercedes-Benz S-Class or a nice Infiniti or a Nissan. You might get a smaller vehicle. But nonetheless, you might get transportation in return for something else. So I will leave it at that. We'll talk much more uh, about these topics throughout my uh, present uh, my panel discussion with the folks here on, on stage, and we'll give you an opportunity as well to ask questions. So thank you very much. And we will actually start now with a presentation by Josh. Thank you, Tilo, and pleasure to speak with you all this evening. It's a bit tough to compete with the offer of a free car, but I hope to, uh, hope to entertain you. Uh, at Peloton, we are con uh, empowering connected drivers and trucks for safety and efficiency. Now, you may think you're in the wrong room. Uh, Tilo just talked about cars. He talked about self-driving cars, self-driving vehicles. We're all about trucks. We're all about safety and efficiency. The reason we care about this is a picture of our, our trucks and some testing we just conducted. Connected uh, technologies allow us to enhance both the driver and the automation technology above a standalone automation system. Drivers, uh, we can augment their ability. We can use this technology to help professionals drive even better than they can today. Trucks, I'm going to try to convince you tonight that this is the ideal market for the introduction of these types of technologies. It has specific characteristics that make it perfect for this. And safety, we can reach uh, levels of safety that are unachievable without this connectivity, um, by, and I'll explain that to you as well. And then it, efficiency is critical to this trucking industry. We can provide unmatched improvement in this efficiency. So let me tell you a little bit about trucking, because on a daily basis, most of us don't interact with trucks other than you know, seeing them on Highway 101. Trucking is a huge industry. It's $600 billion in the US alone per year. So an enormous industry, a relatively small number of vehicles compared to passenger cars, about 600,000 long haul trucks. And unfortunately, they cause about 3,000 fatalities a year. These accidents cost the industry $48 billion. Even a bigger pain point than accidents uh, is fuel use. About $60 billion of diesel is used by long haul trucks each year. So two huge pain points and an industry with razor thin profit margins. One to two percent is typical for these fleets. So as entrepreneurs uh, a few years ago starting Peloton, we, we saw these numbers and we said that's a huge opportunity. Razor thin profit margins, huge pain points. We said if we can improve safety and we can provide double digit highway fuel savings, we could potentially triple the profits of a fleet. Tripling profits is unheard of, and, uh, and we, we had to seize this opportunity. So a little bit about Peloton, founded in, in 2011 here in Menlo Park. Uh, our team includes uh, former director of engineering uh, of Tesla Motors, who's here tonight, uh, uh, Steve Boyd, who was in the uh, Clinton White House, uh, as well as on the PBS NewsHour, and then Chris Gerties of Stanford is our principal scientist, uh, part-time. Uh, uh, and then on our board, we have uh, the former CTO of Trimble Navigation, Ralph Eschenbach, uh, as well as Mark Platchon from Birchmere Ventures. Uh, we're funded by a combination of angel investors, uh, venture capital firm, uh, Birchmere Ventures, uh, and Castrol BP, the, the large uh, oil and lubricants company. So let me tell you a little bit about why we're excited about trucking. Uh, this is a picture we took recently uh, on some of our testing in Utah. And you notice this is not the road that you drive on on a daily basis. So I want to make it very clear, the trucking environment is not your, your morning commute. Uh, it's long, lonely roads, very little traffic. Uh, you can go a half an hour at a time not being passed by anyone or passing anyone. The drivers are trained and they are professional and they have huge experience in general. Um, you know, a typical truck will drive 135,000 miles a year. So they're getting as much experience in one year as we would get in 10 years. Um, cooperation is already in the culture for these truckers. So they, you know, you may see them flashing their lights at each other, communicating with one another. They, they're looking out for, for each other. What we're developing at Peloton is connected trucks. So I want to be very clear, these are not self-driving trucks. Uh, they're not autonomous, um, but they are connected. And let me explain what I mean by that. So we start off with 
individual truck safety. So we use radar sensors similar to the automotive world uh, to provide automatic braking functionality. So if there's an obstacle on the, on the road ahead, we automatically apply the brakes. That technology is in cars, it's, it's available for trucks today. The magic of Peloton system is when we combine pairs of trucks into what we call a close formation platoon. So we have truck-to-truck uh, -truck communication directly between these trucks, which allows us to synchronize the two trucks. Uh, you can think of this as like cruise control, but taken to the next step or maybe the next step beyond that. Uh, this communication allows us to know in the rear truck about the actions of the front truck. So if the front guy slams on the brakes or a control system in the front truck slams on the brakes, we know about it within about 10 milliseconds. A human takes about a second to a second and a half to react, uh, so this is dramatically faster. With this level of safety in place, we can then put the trucks close together and we get aerodynamic effects that provide double-digit fuel savings for these trucks. So it's all about enhancing safety and enhancing efficiency. Um, one more comment there. We, we we're also developing what we call the Platooning Network Operations Center. Uh, this is a central server that allows us to, to, uh, to perform two critical functions for this type of system. The first is to coordinate linking opportunities. So these trucks get the full value from our system only when they're in pairs. So we help them find each other, similar to, a, to a, a taxi finding app or a car sharing app. We help the trucks find a linking partner so they can get this very high level of safety and efficiency. Equally, or probably more importantly, we use this network operation center to ensure safety of the trucks. We only let them link up in close formation when it's safe and approved by us. So this means a safe road, safe weather, safe driver, um, and, and so on. So our system uh, is a controller that's added to the truck. Uh, it interacts with uh, some third-party components, radar, uh, video link, uh, the truck-to-truck -truck communication. We then tie into the truck uh, interface itself to command engine torque, command braking, and so on. Uh, we have a driver interface. And then we have this critical cloud portion that I just described as the network operation center where we provide analytics, we provide uh, optimization about the truck and the fleet, and, and so on. We, we are providing value to these fleets at three levels. So first we start at the truck level uh, where we're providing safety and efficiency through uh, avoiding collisions, increasing efficiency, and so on. At the fleet level, we optimize the fleet. So we provide both diagnostics, prognostics, um, analysis of the driver, of the truck, uh, of equipment selection, and so on. And then at the network level, uh, it's the operations center where we help coordinate these linking opportunities we enable linking when it's safe, and we're really managing this network of, of uh, semi-automated vehicles. We've developed uh, a, a revenue model that has proven very uh, interesting and attractive to these fleets, and that is a, uh, a fee per mile when these trucks are linked and saving fuel. So it's a two and a half cent per mile fee. Uh, I'll take you through a typical trucking operation here. Typical truck will drive 135,000 miles a year. About 105,000 of those are out on the interstate where we can apply our system. We save about 12% of fuel, so about $8,000 a year. We then charge two and a half cents directly to the fleet. That's about a third of their savings. Uh, and uh, the fleet then uh, uh, keeps the other two thirds. Fleets are very capital constrained. Despite spending you know, billions of dollars a year on diesel, they don't have a lot of capital for new technology. So we're offering our system at a very low upfront cost and making our money on this recurring revenue of the, of the two and a half cents per mile. When we talk to a fleet, we're very careful. We tell them payback will be in about 35,000 linked miles. And we let them do the math and say, wow, for our fleet, that could be three months. This is a payback period that's unheard of in the trucking industry, and, and that's why we're, we're getting good traction. Um, we have a, a ton of momentum here I'm, I'm very excited about. Uh, we recently received a U.S. Department of Transportation grant uh, to help develop the system. Um, and uh, this is a great, not only a great uh, financial input, but a great way to, to be very involved with the federal government as these systems uh, come, come about. Uh, we're also working with another part of the federal government, the U.S. DOE, Department of Energy, and NREL on fuel economy uh, verification and testing on a test track. We have partnerships with a major truck maker, uh, Peterbilt, uh, a major braking and control supplier, Meritor Wabco, uh, a vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication supplier, among other things, uh, Indenso, 
uh, and the American Trucking Association, a very influential uh, group in the, in the trucking industry. Uh, we also uh, just conducted some on-highway testing uh, with a major fleet uh, based out of Utah, uh, which will, will provide credible data that we can show to, to the rest of the industry about the fuel savings from our system. Um, I'll, I'll leave you here uh, on this slide with a quote from uh, one of our potential customers, Walmart, who um, was very excited about this pricing model and called our product a no-brainer, which in this context was, was a good thing. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with a picture of our team and a quick mention, uh, an advertisement that we are hiring. Uh, anyone interested, uh, please find people with a Peloton jacket afterwards or myself, and uh, I'd love to, love to talk to you. So thank you. All right, thank you very much, Josh, uh, especially since you also offer jobs, it sounds like. I mean, that's uh, right away going into the business opportunity side. Great, I love it. So I would like to introduce the panel, and I would like to ask actually each panelist to give a little bit of an introduction uh, about yourself and, and the company that you work for. But I would like to attach a question to this as well, which is, you know, why is your company actually interested in this topic? And what's your personal interest that you have in this as well? And Corey, let me start with you. I'm Corey Clothier. I work for Induct Technologies. I am the first employee in the U.S. It's a French-based company, and we are starting our growth in the U.S. Um, now. So I've, I have the tenure of about six or seven weeks, but uh, for the last five years, I've been in this space. I met Josh through um, my Department of Defense work. I've been a consultant with uh, Ground Vehicle Robotics Group with the U.S. Army. And essentially what I've been doing is setting up pilots for automated vehicle systems. And I met Induct and their vehicle called the Navia, the shuttle system. We were setting up a couple of demos for the Department of Defense. I fell in love with the company and the people and um, now I work with them. So it, it's pretty exciting. And um, we're looking at an incremental approach. We're starting with um, all electric vehicles, low speed applications, first and last mile. Um, which is consistent with what we were doing in the Department of Defense. So why we're doing it, there's uh, our CEO, Pierre. He, he's, you know, I, I've talked to him at length about why. And, you know, more than just being cutting edge, first to market, you know, looking at that white space, is that he's really concerned about safety and um, the environment. So that's why he's committed to uh, all electric. And then obviously on the safety side, um, these vehicles won't crash into each other and won't crash into any of you. So um, on the personal side, once I started working with the Department of Defense, I'm a former Marine, is I saw the opportunity again for safety. And then as Josh was pointing out, is that uh, in the Department of Defense, we're a logistics organization. And the amount of fuel that we move and use to, to move fuel is just unbelievable. So the small, a 1% savings is just staggering amount of savings. And then also in the Department of Defense, is um, it, it's in the last 10 years, the leading cause of fatalities in the Department of Defense, surprisingly, isn't war. It's actually traffic accidents. So again, once I learned about this technology, I, you know, became a personal mission of mine. And then, so what I've been doing is trying to pull together agencies in a national strategy and a national deployment uh, plan. Great, so. thank you. And, and by the way, that video that you saw before we started, that was actually a video from Induct Technologies, yes. right? So that folks can maybe combine that as well. Um, Martin, I'm coming next to you. I guess everybody knows the car company that you work for, but why don't you give us an introduction? Yeah, so <clears throat> good evening, everybody. I'm Martin Sierhaus. I'm the director of the Nissan Research Center in Silicon Valley, which uh, was opened in February of this year. Um, that's when I started in February as uh, leading that center. We have three research topics uh, in our center. One is obviously autonomous vehicles. Uh, Nissan is very dedicated to, uh, to bringing autonomous vehicles to, uh, to the masses. Um, the, other, the other research uh, topic is uh, connected vehicles and services. And then the third one is human-machine interaction. Um, so these are three research areas that we, uh, we bring together. And, and of course, autonomous vehicles is one of our big, you know, our big areas that we, uh, why we are here in Silicon Valley. Um, I think it's obvious why Nissan is interested in autonomous vehicles and, and connected vehicles. Um, 
you know, I don't think I have to explain 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 much. But you know, one thing to say is like, uh, as the gentleman here to my right were explaining, you know, zero emission was uh, Nissan's, uh, uh, you know, slogan from a couple of years ago, and they brought the Leaf to market as one of the first mass product uh, production uh, electric vehicles, and and the same thing I think we want to do with um, with autonomous vehicle, and we talk about. Uh, zero fatalities, so zero emissions, zero fatalities, and and that's of course uh, you know something that is we, we're striving for. It's going to be hard to reach that right away, um, but that I think is is the driving force for uh, for Nissan to be part of this. And 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 as with the Leaf, you know, it's an affordable electric vehicle, and I think that's kind of the drive for uh, autonomous vehicles as well. It's it's to really allow everybody to buy an autonomous vehicle. So. So that's kind of the you know the stage for for Nissan to be uh, to operate in in this space. For me personally, um, you know, I was for more than a decade uh, a senior scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, have done a lot of work with astronauts and robots and you know exploring uh, the Martian landscape. But then on Earth, trying to do this kind of technology, create the technology to go to Mars and and work there. Uh, as we all know, um, that's not going to happen anytime soon. So, you know, uh, for me, it is, it's, uh, it's a challenge to bring this kind of technology to Earth and, and solve a real problem. You know, my, my passion, I mean, everybody's passion who works at NASA is about creating knowledge and, you know, extending the capability of humankind. And, and that's why you work at NASA, that's why you go there. I think to take that technology that we have developed over the last 10 years while we were there and then apply it to a, you know, a, a problem that can, can solve issues on Earth, I think, you know, how can you refuse when you get offered that kind of uh, opportunity? Um, you know, and I, I want to start with one, one point of my last point is, you know, I look at cars and, and the autonomous vehicle more from a social perspective and from a teamwork perspective. And that's where I come from, you know. So I say I want to create a social car as a team member. And that is how I look at the, the technology. And so it's not just about creating technology. It's about allowing people to interact with technology in a way that is natural and allows you to uh, behave and act naturally in the way you want to do it. And that's the challenge that I think we have ahead of, it, ahead of us. Um, and that's it. I'll leave it at that. And then I have to ask you that quick question, since you provided a little bit of background in terms of what you used to do. What would come first, driverless cars or us going to Mars? <laughs> what do you think? Well, <laughs> oops, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing your water. Um, well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, if you would have asked me that five, six years ago, I would have said going to Mars. You know, it's uh -huh. like that's, but you know, we're not going to go to Mars until 2050. Uh, so unless, unless you are all willing to pay a lot more taxes. Um, <laughs> so unfortunately, um, or fortunately, I would say uh, autonomous vehicles. Okay, fair enough. Luca. Thanks, Lilo. Yeah, my name is Luca Grossi, and I work with uh, Mercedes-Benz here in the Silicon Valley. It's now about uh, eight years that I work with uh, this company here at this location. Um, I'm not really a car guy strictly, so my background is more into software development. I started as a developer of uh, operating system software. At that time, since I have uh, quite a few years, it was called Unix. Now people use Linux systems. And uh, I'm also an expert in networking. And what brought me here to the Silicon Valley is really in 2005, people were really starting talking about connected vehicles. And I thought that you know, the next step in networking was really connecting cars. Uh, I come from a world where uh, we had uh, wired uh, offices. You had to uh, reach a printer in, in the next room. At some point, you became able to move your laptop and, uh, without wires. And, uh, and that was connectivity. Uh, today, we are connected everywhere we go, but connecting cars is still uh, a step that uh, we need to, uh, to reach, and it's really exciting, and, and we are getting there. Um, what I do here is I'm the lead of the activities in the U.S. Uh, for Mercedes-Benz um, around uh, advanced driver assistance systems, 
And basically, we have three areas of research that we focus on. And all of three uh, these areas are extremely exciting. So one is ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. Obviously, we have a lot of systems um, in, in the market and many more that we are preparing for the next uh, generation of our cars. Uh, connected vehicles, that's the, the second one. And then autonomous driving. And it's really nice to see how uh, the advanced driver assistance systems and the connected vehicles are coming together. Uh, and uh, they all contribute to, uh, to the reality of autonomous driving at this point. I don't need probably to explain why Mercedes-Benz is involved in this. I think it's just in our DNA. Um, if you um, search on the web and look a little bit on, at the history of autonomous driving, you will see that uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, already had autonomous cars back in the 80s. Uh, there was a famous uh, challenge to drive from, I believe, from Munich to uh, Ostend or something like this in, somewhere in the Netherlands. And uh, that was accomplished with the technology of those days. I mean, those engineers were really amazing. Uh, you know, when, whenever I think that uh, the people who basically sent uh, uh, space rockets to the moon didn't have the computers that we have today, but they were doing their calculations uh, mostly by hand. I mean, th those people were really amazing. We, we have a kind of an easy life uh, these, these days. So uh, Mercedes-Benz really has um, innovation tradition in, in safety systems and obviously also in autonomous driving in their DNA. Um, I think it was kind of an easy transition uh, into autonomous driving. Actually, I feel we already have you know, our feet uh, on, on the path to, to the autonomous car. Um, some of the products we have on the market today have a lot of uh, automated features. We can talk about this a little bit later. And uh, we also proved uh, the kind of capabilities we, we can have in a recent challenge, but maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. great, thank you. And that brings us to Sven. So my name is Sven Stobrand. Um, I'm a partner and the CTO at Coastal Ventures. And I probably do have to explain why Coastal Ventures has an interest in this. But um, before I get started, uh, maybe a few words about, uh, uh, about Coastal Ventures. So we are um, a venture capital firm here on, on Santa Road in, in, in Menlo Park. We typically invest in early stage technology driven, uh, driven companies. Um, on the financial metrics, we have a billion dollar main fund and an associated seed fund out of which we are investing. And typically the next question I get asked, what the hell does CTO mean of a, of a, of a venture fund? Um, you can just, for, for the sake of discussion, just replace this with geek in residence. Um, now to the, um, to, to the interest we, we have. So, uh, we are not a large automotive company. It's maybe not entirely obvious why we're interested in this, but there's two tracks to answer this question. One is a personal one, and uh, the other one is a, is a firm-wide one. So we have an interest in autonomous system and robotics. And um, autonomous systems for us are not only self-driving cars or necessarily physical manifestations of, of autonomous systems. They can also be purely software systems. Um, but increasingly, they include hardware systems. So for example, we have robots in the field in agriculture doing uh, salad thinning. Um, so we have a, an interest in these autonomous systems if they have a very defined business case associated to them. Um, I personally have a bit of an interest in this. So um, I'm an engineer by training. I actually did my master's and PhD here. And, um, uh, I, I, I worked after my, my uh, PhD actually at a car company, a VW and, 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 and Audi. So I ran a bunch of different projects, but the project that is actually most relevant here is I got lucky and there was the lead engineer for the um, DAPA Grand Challenge team, which was a joint project between um, Stanford and the VW Research Lab here, here in the Valley. And that was in 2005, and we got very lucky, and we won the DARPA Gun Challenge, and the car ended up in the Smithsonian Museum. So it was all happiness all around. But then, unfortunately, the largest chunk of the team all went to Google. But <laughs> uh, I moved on as well. I, um, I got recruited to, to a venture fund called Modavida Ventures, and then about a year ago, I got a phone call from uh, my boss, um, uh, Vinod. Uh, some of you might, might know him. He's the founder of Sun Microsystems. Um, and, um, uh, um, a reasonably prominent investor, I would say. And um, 
in my industry, that's the sort of phone call you actually take. And so um, I'm, I'm at Costa Ventures now. And so that's maybe the personal side on the, on the, on the involvement uh, with this. My perspective on this is really a little bit different because I don't have some of the luxuries that large car companies have. So um, it's okay in a large car company if something gets introduced over a period of 10 years, uh, slowly and meaningfully and in large volume. Um, that's tough for us. <laughs> um, we need to invest in startups that uh, show, show a return uh, earlier than that. Um, also, our startups don't have the resources uh, a Mercedes-Benz can, put, for example, put at a, at, at a problem like that. So my target set of opportunities maybe looks a little bit different um, than a large, uh, large OEM. And so maybe that's the perspective I can, I, I can bring to the panel. Yeah, great, super. And uh, you, know, you brought up the, the, the key word here, timing. You know, when will things happen? And, and how important is it to see certain evolutionary steps so that there's a business case behind this? I'm just curious from the panelists' perspective, how far are we from realizing this vision of the autonomous vehicle? And obviously, we're talking about different interpretations of autonomous vehicles right now. But from your specific perspective, and I want to start with the automotive guys first, you know, how far are we really from this? Um, I made a prediction last year. I know that some of the companies in the industry made some predictions over the last couple of months in particular. Martin, maybe I start with you because I know Carlos Ghosn said something. Maybe you can just tell the audience what it is that he said not too long ago. Well, Nissan has announced that uh, they will have an autonomous vehicle as a mass market product vehicle by 2020. Um, so, so that's what the challenge that, uh, you know, thank you very much, Carlos Ghosn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, show me the money and I will deliver is what I uh, try to. Uh... <laughs> no, is that realistic without, of course, contradicting your CEO, but. Well, you know, but, <laughs> you know the, the wonderful thing about these kind of announcements is that, you know, they didn't say what autonomous vehicle right. Means, <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, so yeah. I mean, I, I think it's definitely realistic. I mean, from a technology point of view, I, I don't yeah. see any reason why it's not realistic. Yep. Um, you know, we were on the moon in ten years when the president said, you know, we shall go to the moon, right? So you put smart people together in a room and you give them resources. You know, I think this this. This technology not will be and is going to be cracked. But you know, my the point is, is I think that it's not just about technology. Right. right. Good. Good point. And you know, hold that thought because we'll definitely talk about these other issues as well. Um, Luca, from your perspective, you now how far are we away from it? Yeah, 2020 is kind of a, an attractive date. I think everybody's looking at that for several reasons. Of course, uh, psychologically, because it's the end of a decade before we go into the next decade but also from the industry perspective, if you look at the cycle that we have in the production of new model, in production of new models, it makes sense that around that time we'll have some other uh, new model coming out on the market that could make the difference. But I think we need to highlight a couple of things. So number one, uh, I wanna be a little bit optimistic, a little bit pessimistic, try to balance this out. But uh, on the bright side, uh, we are into the future today. So we have cars really on the road today that uh, don't do maybe everything that you would like an autonomous vehicle to do, but a lot of these things. So when you start telling the driver that you know he doesn't have to control the gas pedal anymore, so you can just you know just relax and uh, release your foot from from the brake pedal, that's already starting to help. And the car that we have on the market right now lets you actually leave your hands off the wheel. So for the first time when you drive these cars, you will see the wheel just spinning without you actually uh, maneuvering it. And you know, psychologically, this, this is a big thing. This is a big thing. Um, legally, we still have uh, uh, issues. So basically, for instance, the system we have on the market right now will warn the driver if uh, there are no hands on the wheel for 10, 15 seconds. You will see a nice icon on the instrument cluster with a pair of uh, red gloves and indicating, okay, please grab the wheel, tell me, tell me you're there, because the car will be scared if the driver will not be there at that point. Uh, so, but for the very first time, we see uh, what we call longitudinal control and lateral control uh, coming together uh, on a production vehicle. So really this is, the present is, is, is uh, I mean, it's really amazing what's already available. Uh, 
the future, how far we are from the future, again, um, how complete is this vision? If the vision is uh, the full vision, then I think we are still far away. Uh, we, we won't do that in this decade. Uh, but you know, before you um, achieve the final goal, there are several steps that you can take. And uh, a lot of these steps are going to happen in the next five, seven years. Well, some of these steps already have happened, right? If I look to my left here, uh, the gentleman here, both of them actually, you talked about this quite a bit, you, uh, Josh. But uh, Corey, from your perspective, you know, we saw the video. So I can already use your technology to have a self-driving vehicle, right? But it's in a controlled environment, isn't it? Yes. It has to call it semi-controlled. Can you describe that a little bit? Because sure. I think that would be interesting for the audience to understand. Well, too. and I think the audience will be interested is our first uh, pilot that's actually going to be integrated with traffic is going to be here, and it starts in January. So the, we'll have two vehicles over at the Slack campus at uh, the accelerator, and they'll be up and running in January. So that. It's not a controlled environment. It's, that's why I would call it semi-controlled. It's, it's low speed. The speed limit around the loop road, I think, is 15 miles an hour, which is perfect because that's what we, we limit ours at about 12 to 13 miles an hour for this vehicle and uh, because there's no passenger restraint. But it's kind of a, just reinforcing what you said, is that th this isn't our only vehicle. Uh, this is our first vehicle. So we are actually working on a four-seat, four um, smaller, electric vehicle uh, next year in 2014. So within five years, that actually I think within two years, that thing will actually uh, be on the market. But it will be a limited application again. It would likely start at uh, in a dedicated lane, you know, something like an airport shuttle. Um, there's these aerotropolises that are popping up around the country and they're really looking at their mobility strategies. And so something like that would be perfect. It's basically just a logistics play. It's moving people back and forth to the airport. So you feel pretty comfortable with the technology then, right? That yeah. you have that down. Yeah. And, and maybe spend a question for you then. When you look at potential companies to invest into, is it primarily the technology companies that you're looking for at this point? Is it more the application side of, of things? So we, it's, it's coupled, right? So we, we, we don't do technology for technology's sake, uh, even though, though occasionally I get really, really excited about the technology. <laughs> but... Um, we do need to see a business case that, that, that sits behind it, and it must be a relatively immediate business case. So, um, and what does that mean, immediate? Well, give us a time frame. Oh, so um, you mean in a time to revenue for, yeah. for a mm -hmm. company like that? So um, that should be on the order of like three years. Okay. Let's say there's three years of, of, of technology development, and then we should start to see a, a, a revenue and first customer engagements and all of that. Um, so we, in, in that regard, we're a little bit more, more constrained. Okay. Um, I, I wanted to make one, one comment regarding how fast we adopt this. And so one of the things we haven't done is actually properly define what each one of us means. Because there's a very mm -hmm. large variability between a heavy dose of driver assistance systems where the driver still needs to actually pay attention and I would mm -hmm. argue or submit that if, I, if the car does every action by itself, but I need to <laughs> constantly supervise the car, that's almost as good as driving. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, then there's the other case, which is, let's call that full autonomy, um, where I really don't have to pay attention. And that, mm -hmm. in, in my humble opinion, is a much, much, much harder nut to crack, just because statistically, I mean, there's lots of fatalities in the U.S., and it's, it's a tragedy. But statistically, humans are actually quite good drivers if you do it on a per-mile basis. So getting a robot to that level mm -hmm. um, re of reliability, I, I think is not quite that easy. So when you answer the question, it kind of depends on which of those two camps you're in, in my mind. Absolutely. So you know, that's why I shared, for example, our point of view, automated, autonomous, and even driverless, right? which is even further out there, because yeah. then you don't have really any person to really take um, or shut the system down. Um, Josh, you know, we talked about technology and how reliable it is. You know, in your case, the technology has to be pretty reliable to function, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so absolutely, it has to be reliable. Um, keep in mind, and, and uh, my presentation was brief, we are leaving the driver in control of steering. So we keep the driver in the loop, 
Uh, we, never, uh, we never depend on the driver to react quickly uh, to retake control. If, uh, if something does malfunction in the system, we back the rear truck away from the front truck, let the driver retake control at their convenience. So it has to be extremely reliable in its fault detection. It has to be very reliable in general, but the fault detection is the most critical part uh, because we do always have the driver to, to fall back on. And again, not on a, on a quick reaction, but to, to hand control back over to that driver. And how much time does a driver have? Uh, they have, they have uh, many seconds because we, uh, if, if a fault occurs or, or the system needs to disengage the trucks, we start applying the brakes or the, or the engine brake in the rear truck, backing the truck away safely, uh, and then they can retake control of the accelerator. Um, so they could, they could wait as long as they want to retake the accelerator, they would just slow down. I see. So that's the system to actually save anything bad from happening. That's right. Um, which brings up another interesting point. This whole handoff between a system disengaging for whatever mm. reason, maybe because it's a, a legal issue, like in Mercedes-Benz case, we have to put your hands back on after 10 seconds. What if people are just not in the state of mind to really take over in that case? How do you measure this? How do you make sure that that actually happens? And I, Luca, I was wondering from your perspective, based on the fact that the S class was already launched and in certain places uh, longer ago than here in the US. Is there any insight that Mercedes has on this? How people react? I mean, are they still alert, as Sven was saying? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, I totally agree with Sven. I mean, this system still belongs to the category of systems where the driver has to pay attention. I mean, we never claim that you know, the driver can uh, get distracted with, uh, with the current uh, S class model. So um, the driver has to be there, has to be. Uh, has to pay attention and be ready to, to take control. Um, as far as your question, um, what we're doing is we're doing a lot of studies. Studies with um, simulators and uh, comparing reaction from different users. Obviously, there's no just simple answer. Uh, reaction time can be extremely different from person to person, uh, situation to situation. And also, it depends uh, how, my, how much freedom you're giving to the driver. Are you telling the driver that they can you know, take the eyes off the road for a few seconds? That's one thing. Are you telling the driver they can start reading a book or working on their laptop? That's a different thing, right? Are you telling the driver they will, I don't know, engage with activities of the people in the back of the car, just playing games or talking to your kids or do other things like that and completely not look at the road? So there, there are several stages and we need to understand uh, what happens in each of, the, uh, each of those stages and uh, we need to come up with a model for returning control to the driver in an appropriate way. So this is really the question of how, um, yeah, how we'll change, uh, how driving will change. And do we Which, need uh, training? Do we need special training right. to driver? Because imagine you know, people get used to this. Maybe we all lose the skill of driving. What happens then yeah. if I just don't even know what to do anymore in a certain situation? Yeah. And I, I, I wonder. Just, just sorry. Oh. Yeah. No, I, I just wanted to get a, another you know show of hands from the audience. So we had a bunch of people earlier that said, "Yep, we're interested in autonomous vehicles." How many of you would still be interested in it if you actually have to pay attention to what the vehicle does? Meaning you can't really do what you really <laughs> want to do, which is maybe you know eating, reading a book, whatever, playing games with the other guy next to you in the car. So how many of you are still interested, even if you have to pay attention constantly? It's still quite a bit, but not as much as we had before, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. So that kind of shows that maybe setting up the right expectation is really important in all of this, right? Because I find it fascinating that there are cars on the road today where you can do this, but the fact that I have to actually put my hands back on the steering wheel after 10 seconds kind of is a downer to some extent, right? But we know why this is because of legal implications. And Martin, you brought this up earlier. The technology might be there by the end of this decade, but we may have other issues to deal with. Maybe. Um, legal issues, or is even society ready to embrace this? What are your thoughts on, on that topic? Well, you know, I'm always reminded by uh, my professor in human-computer interaction <laughs> who's telling me, like, you know, it would be so easy if there would just be no people involved. <laughs> 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 I, you know, um, so, I, so I actually... So, so there is my personal opinion, and then there is, you know, what, uh, you know, what everybody else might think. But, you know, I, I actually think it is not that big of a deal. That's my personal opinion. What, what part is not that much the, of a big deal? You know, to, to either have a car where you have to pay attention. You know, I drive uh, a Q50 where it breaks by itself, it keeps laying by itself. I can spend 
you know, longer than 50 seconds on 101 and not touch my steering wheel. Um, and, you know, it is nice. It is nice. I can look at my text, you know. <laughs> you know, you might not believe it, but... Isn't that illegal? <laughs> well, you know, how many... <laughs> how many people... Just thought I wanted to clarify this. How many, people, how many people don't do it while they're driving now, Absolutely. you know? So, yeah. so, and actually, you know, one thing that I actually noticed, like, in San Francisco, where I live, it is actually even better because there are so many cars that are next to me, in front of me, I, you know, and the car actually will stop if I don't pay attention. So I think people will like it. I think adoption will be easy. Um, just like when you would ask somebody, you know, 15 years ago about the iPhone and do you need something like that, nobody would be saying, oh, no, but, you know, only, only the young people, uh, you know, here we are. So I think adoption of technology is faster and faster as time goes on. So I don't think that, you know, what I, where I worry is not so much about how we tell the person to pay attention and take over. Um, because it's just like, you know, uh, now it's like, oh, don't do this, otherwise you get confused and you might crash. You know, we will have the same kind of notifications in the car. What I think is difficult is as the car becomes more sophisticated, the autonomous system, you know, it's a well-known fact that people create models about decision-making of other autonomous entities. And those models are very often wrong. And if you look at autonomous systems now today in the airplanes, most crashes that happen today is because the pilot has a different model of what is actually happening in the decision making of the system about what the system is actually doing. And I think that is the hard part in the end about fully autonomous system, is to let the person know what the car is thinking and when it's unsafe and when it's actually maybe when it's unsafe for you to touch the steering wheel and not you know these are the things that actually worry me most from a research point of view than actually warning the person you know I always say you know a big red button and a loud noise it will work <laughs> but you know that's this my personal uh, my personal opinion so that's an interesting point of view and uh, before we go to the audience questions I, I just have another question for the for the group here which is in terms of the the business opportunities how to make money of autonomous vehicle technologies. And I will start with you, Sven, so you have a, an extra second to think about this. Um, you know, since you're the VC, um, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, what is it really that will create value, and, and business value in particular? I'm, I'm curious from all of the, the panelists, but starting with you, Sven. Okay, so um, I have a bit of a yardstick. Um, I'm not only focused on just purely automotive uh, sure. applications, mm -hmm. so my, my lens is a little bit broader here. So what are typically, typically the, the benefits fall in, in just a few categories. So one is straight up labor savings because you have now an autonomous system doing a, a task that needed a set of n humans before. Then um, there's not, that alone typically, in most cases, doesn't quite get you there. Um, the thing that I find interesting is if you can change the performance metrics um, that are relevant in a particular industry. I'm being here super vague, so let me make this more, more, more clear. So for example, um, if you do an agricultural operation that is currently done by hand, and you do it with a robot, and by that act, the yield of that plant increases, that typically is a much stronger driver for adoption than the labor saved. So um, that's what I mean, directly tied to a particular business case. Um, as far as opportunities in, in automotive, there's typically opportunities in, uh, on the sensor side, um, there's opportunities on the system side. That being said, I come from the automotive industry and I have seen how a typical automotive value chain parses out. So that is often a very difficult space for a startup to, 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 to prevail. So. Um, uh, that's not excluded from the list, but I have a certain set of biases, mm -hmm. let's say it like that. Okay, and that's an interesting question. Let's uh, ask Luca and, and Martin about this. You know, is, there an, is there a role to play for startups in your efforts to realize self-driving vehicles? Luca, maybe you go first. Yeah, I, I believe there is. I mean, uh, obviously big companies have their view of the world, but, uh, and they have the advantage of a strong present and presence and 
uh, big resources, but I mean, uh, startups have the other advantage. They can go to, they can move towards a target very quickly. They can identify an opportunity and uh, you know just focus on that opportunity. Um, I'm excited about the two uh, startups that you know were are represented here today. Uh, it's uh, it's great business models, and uh, obviously, I really hope that they will be successful. I think we're going to see changes in the industry. So um, the. The car industry has a tradition, but the tradition was more uh, related to the provision of the hardware that makes a car and the mechanics. And now we're really moving into a uh, domain where software is going to play the big difference. And how this will come together needs to be, to be seen. So obviously there are companies that are, have much more expertise in producing software than a car company. At the same time, is a car company willing to let somebody else write the software that determines how the car drives, right? So for instance, uh, we have a, a chance to personalize the car through the software. So it would be nice that a Mercedes, uh, which is an autonomous Mercedes, would still drive with a feel you know, of a Mercedes. And people realize, OK, I'm not driving it, but the car is, is taking me onto the road, and it feels like, like a Mercedes. Um, there are opportunities in providing services to the cars. Um, for instance, in creating uh, maps or delivering information to the car. Uh, the, these cars will likely, very likely be connected. And there will be the need for uh, maps that are refreshed continuously with, with data in real time that describe the situation on the road. An autonomous car needs to know if there is a construction uh, today on, on my commute, or if the road looks like what it looked like yesterday. So I think there's plenty of opportunities, and we just mentioned a few of them. There are many other industry uh, segments that... So when I heard you correctly, you're saying the connected vehicle itself presents lots of opportunities, right, that you can Absolutely. actually tie um, or combine with the self-driving capabilities. Martin, um, now is it difficult still to work with automotive companies if you're a startup and you have a great idea to realize the vision of an autonomous vehicle? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I completely agree with, with you know, what Luca's saying. And for me, well, for Nissan, I mean, why, why do they decide to come to Silicon Valley and create a lab like all the other uh, automotive companies? And, I, you know, for Nissan, it's three reasons, right? Um, one is we know that we need the type of talent that is here in, this, in the valley. And, and it's, you know... Um, in, ter in case of Nissan, it's, it's mostly the, the AI talent and the, the computer science talent to build the technology and the autonomy uh, in the car, right? That's one reason. Um, and the other reason um, is because we can drive the car on the road here, right? That's all, a, a, another big reason to be here. Um, but the third reason, and, and I think that this might be a little unique to Nissan, which they have realized is that they want, you know, they want open innovation, right? We want to be able to, we, we're here especially to be working with startups to bring in. And, you know, I, I've defined, I define this as, uh, you know, the lean research cycle, right? Um, you know, I've been in research a long time and, and, you know, research is a cycle in of itself. You know, in, in the 90s, all the companies did away with research and now it's coming back. But why did they do away with research? In my opinion, is because they were ivory towers, and it took too long to, to actually get value out of an enormous, expensive research organization. And I think the only way to, uh, you know, to speed that up is to actually work with, with startups, like you're saying, and bringing in, bringing in other ideas and, and, and making sure that you can, you know, you can bring this technology you know, out in, in production fast. Um, and the car companies are not set up to do that. And, and this is a, you know, this is a challenge, and I agree that the it's easier to do it in the connected vehicle side um, than doing it with sensor technology or something because it's a long, you know, it, it it's it's a long time before you can, you know, take a sensor and the type of technology and make it into a product that uh, that will actually make money, and and so that's a hard thing, uh, but building software is easier, um, and so. But 
you know, um, I think it's 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 the opportunities for startups are are only starting, you know, and it will only become bigger. Great. So I want to change gears to get to the audience questions. We have a lot of questions here. Unfortunately, not enough time. Um, so I will try to aggregate a couple of those. And I had more questions as well, but we already touched on a couple of those, which which is great. Um, let's stick a little bit more on the technology side. So uh, this debate has come up before. Um, Josh, you demonstrate a technology that requires or enables vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Um, the question is, do we actually need vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication in order to realize autonomous cars? Or can these autonomous cars be so autonomous that they don't really need to talk to anybody else? Which I, I think, Corey, is the system that you guys are using, right? So I want to ask both of you guys, what do you think about this? Go first, Josh. Sure, I'll start. Um, I'm going to answer a slightly different question than the one you asked, which is I, I want to talk a little bit about the advantages of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication above what you could do with an autonomous car. Um, so the, the fundamental advantage of vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication is you're getting data from the perspective of that other vehicle. If you just have an autonomous vehicle, you can have the best sensors in the world. It's all from your perspective. Um, so, and, and I mean this in the broad sense. So it could be you know, visual occlusion, that there's a, a tree or a barrier and there's a vehicle coming from around that barrier. You can have the best LIDAR sensor in the world, you're not gonna be able to see around that barrier. Vehicle to vehicle communication, you would know that that vehicle's coming. So there are very strong advantages to vehicle to vehicle communication above what is you know, physically and, and technically possible in an autonomous vehicle. Um, so now to answer your question a little bit more, is it an, an, a necessary enabling technology? I would say no. Uh, for, for many environments, you can, you can make an autonomous vehicle uh, without vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. However, you will not have as high of performance in terms of you can't get to the same safety level. You can't get as much efficiency in the broad sense of efficiency um, as you could with that vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. Okay, and then really briefly, maybe from a couple of other folks, Corey, do we need that? Do you offer this? I mean, do you need to have with it? With our low speed application, we don't need it. But with higher speed, I agree with Josh, it's, it's going to enhance the system. And how do you avoid then getting into a situation where there might be traffic, even at low speed? I mean, how do you deal with this? Is it just that your technology can understand what's going on and that's good enough? Yeah, pretty much. It, it, it's smart enough at least to acknowledge that there's an obstacle and when the obstacle goes away, we continue on our path. And I guess the low speed helps with that, obviously, right? right? I mean, you know, we're talking about last mile right. application, so. Really briefly, a yes or no answer from Martin and from Luca. Do we need vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication for the autonomous car? How could we give a yes or no answer? Yeah, come on. <laughs> because we have so many questions. <laughs> you know? Yes, no, no. So, um, no, but more sensor data is better and easier. <laughs> you know, I even say, you know, I want, you know, vehicle to pedestrian communication, you know, give me your cell phone, you know, so the, the, the more the better. And companies are working on that, by the way, GM, for example, right? Yeah. But uh, Luca, yes or no? Because we have so many questions. Guys. So, so, same thing, it's a no because we built autonomous cars without vehicle-to-vehicle um, -vehicle communication, so it is possible to create the technology without. But if we had vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, it would have been much, much easier. But, but, you know, let me say one thing. We can't rely on it. Right, so that's the thing, you know. So, so, so this is why the application of platooning in trucks is a wonderful application for this kind of technology. I think it's it's, and and I applaud you for for doing this, you know, because, but but in on, you know, we cannot assume that tomorrow everybody will have vehicle vehicles with communication things in it unless, you know, the government will make it mandatory. We're cheating the system a little bit too. I didn't mention that we kind of like Josh was talking about. We have an overarching network control system. So, you know, there's, it's not vehicle to vehicle on our Navia systems, but it's vehicle to, you know, big brother back to other vehicles. Mm -hmm. So if there's an obstacle in the way and it maybe it's a false obstacle, we can see, no, this is safe. It's just a plastic bag, move on and continue on. Or if okay. it really is an issue, stop the vehicle or move it aside. Another question that I have here, and that's a tricky one, you know, it's, it's with regards to interoperability between autonomous vehicle systems. I guess we don't really need that, though, do we? Yeah, I don't want to talk to Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we're neighbors in Sunnyvale, so you better talk to us. <laughs> we're going to find each other on the road. 
no, oh yeah. Uh, so that that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> you know, of course, you know, <laughs> it'd be silly, right? If I, you know, if the Nissan cannot talk to the Mercedes. I mean, that'd be a silly. Because uh... it's kind of well, interesting if you think about it. If everybody has a similar technology, how do even consumers understand the the different aspects? How do you ensure competition going forward and differentiation in the systems that you have? Will there be one? Will it be based on classic car features? Or will a Mercedes be faster than a Nissan um, autonomous vehicle? Or where can you take it we just We just announced <laughs> the fastest uh, sports vehicle yesterday, so. So maybe that's uh, an indicator so, there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but do you have a, a, a kind of opinion on this? I mean, how do you drive differentiation if everybody has the same? Well, the, there, there are boundaries. I mean, it's nice to offer uh, a great driving experience, but I think uh, we need to be a little bit conservative and we will respect all traffic rules, okay? So we're not going <laughs> to create the fastest autonomous car. If there's a stop, we're going to stop. And if there's a speed limit, we're going to drive below the speed <laughs> limit. That's... Well, and maybe this question is then better directed at Swin, but when you look at some companies that potentially you could invest into, how do you define competitive differentiation or better positioning of a certain company over another? So uh, most of the companies in this space are actually relatively unique and don't really have that much existing competition. So for example, I mean, let's pick one of the panelists, uh, um, Peloton. There's actually not that much uh, other, uh, other companies in that particular space. You need to build up the network so mm. people can actually find to themselves and so on. Um, in that case, if we would just, I don't mean to pick on you, Josh, but <laughs> if, if we would just take that, that space, what's rambling in the back of my mind is, well, there's all the vehicle technology, maybe other people can do the vehicle technology, but people still need to find each other, so there's actually a network effect here. If you are first to market with a network, you have a decent share of it, that might actually be defensible even against other folks that have a bigger war chest than I have. So that's kind of the chain of thought that I would use to, to think my, my, myself through there. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking for things that are defensible via, for example, a network effect, even though you know, the startup doesn't have a billion dollar balance sheet. Right. Does first mover advantage play a role here for these technologies, to be the first one with a certain technology? It's the first one that actually cracks the usefulness scale so you actually have a decent business, scale, uh, business case. So, it doesn't matter very much to me that you're the first. It, it must be the first that's relevant to that customer set and actually makes the economics all work. Okay. Um, so this is not an, an exercise in you know, being in the record book for being the first. It's the, the, the scalably first. That's sure. Like that. sure, but you do see that if somebody has the ability to be first with a new business case, business innovation, maybe business model, that that could actually have an impact on this versus you know, others following suit. Yes, that, that, that's what I mean. If you, if you have um, things like network effects that would protect the business long term, then yes, then, okay. then it's absolutely valuable to, to, to be early. That's actually a, a, a good point. You know? So in, in your company, you know, do you, would you allow other trucks that sign up with other companies to join your pack, so mm. to speak? Mm. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So absolutely, we will have inter-fleet linking. So you know, our initial customers, um, most, most of our initial customers will be large fleets who have multiple trucks operating together and they can, they can link up and, and make very little change to their operations, save fuel and be more efficient. Um, we're also in talks with um, companies that organize trucks together who may come from different fleets and those companies could organize them together for our purpose and have them link up. In terms of interoperability with other uh, platooning companies, as Sven mentioned, you know, we're, we're fairly unique in this space right now. Uh, we will not initially be interoperable because there's nobody to interoperate with. Um, over time, if that's potentially possible, uh, it's not to our advantage uh, to do so, of course, because of the strong network effect that, that Sven mentioned. Um, it's also, from a technical standpoint, much more difficult than other forms of interoperability. It's not just a matter of sending the right data about braking and torque and so on. Um, you also have to have the, the right behavior in the system. So it, that would be a, a, a challenge to have that interoperability. Um, and it, it shouldn't be necessary. Um, you know, we'll be selling to customers who can then link up with our other customers and, and, and grow organically in that way. Okay. Um, I have a bunch of questions here, not a bunch, a few questions, and, and I had one myself on business models. I talked a little bit about how maybe going forward you might get a free car. 
because maybe somebody else will actually pay or make money in a different indirect business model way. I'm just curious, you know, are you concerned about that disruption? Do you see or envision new business models to occur as it relates to autonomous vehicles in the broadest sense, not just from a passenger vehicle perspective? And maybe I start um, with, with you, you know, Josh. You, know, you already have a, a disruption, if you will, in this market. Yeah, so I, I think, um, you know, I think what we're excited about with our business model is the, the recurring revenue and the ability to get it in the user's hands quickly and easily. And that that's, um, we think that's somewhat unique um, and that we can, you know, reduce that barrier. Um, you know, I didn't talk about sort of the, our entire business model. I think one really interesting thing in this space is additional services that are enabled by this technology. So for example, in the trucking world, once we have this hardware in the truck, we'll have all of this data about fuel economy, about braking performance, about driver performance, gear selection, I could, I could go on and on. Um, and we can then pr uh, provide these analytic services, other types of services that can dramatically increase the efficiency of the fleet in terms of the fleet operations. Um, and we're developing business models for how to price those services because those have huge value to these fleets. Um, I think the same thing, by the way, applies in, in the automotive world. Uh, once you have advanced sensors and you know your environment better, you can do a much better job of judging, you know, is the driver driving safely and appropriately? Um, it, it, these types of sensors and technologies provide context for the data you have today. Um, and so I think there's really interesting business models around how to provide that data to either individual drivers, uh, to insurance companies, um, to fleet, you know, fleet managers, uh, to the OEMs themselves, to component makers, and, and so on. Are you worried, Martin and, and Luca, about the disruption that could come from this? I mean, are the car companies worried about that people may not be that interested in owning a car and might actually replace that with um, you know, transportation when you need it? Well, well you know, I, I, I'm not a, by any stretch of the imagination an expert in the automotive world. Uh, you know, I just joined Nissan in February, so, you know, but uh, the, you know, the one thing is that uh, the car companies are, are looking at, you know, at anything beyond two years, three years prediction of what will happen with the buying, you know, uh, how people will buy cars is kind of like a crystal ball that nobody has. So. And I don't think that the disruption will come in that 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 time period. Um, so are they worried? I think that you know, if if you ask the the sales, uh, you know, EVP, he'd be worried about his numbers, you know, this year and next year, and you know what's out there. But from the perspective of what will happen to the car industry in the long term, you know, I think they we're all thinking about, you know, what this technology could mean. Um, and, and thinking about different business models, but, but that's also an opportunity um, to innovate, to change, um, and you know, so that's, that's where I leave it. It would be a big change though, right? Because we would go away from just being what we call an automaker today to maybe becoming a mobility solution provider, right? And, and yeah, the, the one thing, you know, which, which, you know, I hate to bring this up, but, but you know, in, in the uh, kind of business that, that, that Josh is in, it's, so you, the, the, who owns the data right there? It's, it's the, the trucking company that owns the truck, you know, the driver is an employee. And so it's kind of a little easier than if you think about normal cars. Um, you know, so privacy data, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a big nut to crack that, that I don't think anybody has, a, has really d done that. So w where that will go, I think is, is still open. And look at Daimler does a lot of things, including yeah. Movil in Europe, which is a mobility service, or car to go which you know, offers Yeah, I was about vehicles. to mention that. Yeah, and I, and I agree with Martin. I mean, there would be more opportunities, and car to go is an example. So people can just take a car and leave the car somewhere, and somebody else will, will, will take it for the next ride. Um, so it's exciting because there are so many, many new opportunities. I think uh, what some people might fear is that, oh, well, now we have these autonomous cars. What happens to... Uh, the pleasure of driving, right? But honestly, I personally, this is my personal opinion, I think we, we, we like to drive. I think people love to drive. They, the, the car gives you freedom, takes you somewhere, takes you places where you want, when you want. And uh, as much as there are many situations where autonomous driving is great, like, you know, when you're in a traffic jam or in a boring uh, drive, uh, there are other situations where you, you would just love to have uh, your, 
uh, your convertible and go down uh, Highway 1, right, along, along the Pacific. So I think it's not either one or the other. It's the opportunity for us to create a product that's a better product that can serve, uh, it, it can serve multiple purposes, so you can adapt it to the, your, what you want to do that day. I hope you're right that the fun of driving would be preserved, you know, because I can tell you that based on some discussions that we are having with government agencies, they are beginning to get very interested in not just this pay as you drive, but pay how you drive going mm -hmm. forward. And that could have some limitations to how much fun you have. And I always tell people that who love cars, go out and buy the dream car that you ever wanted now. In 10 years, it might be a different story. You might not really be able to drive it that much anymore. But, but you, you know, if you, if you look at you said 48 minutes in a day that people drive on average. How, how many minutes of that day is actually ple pleasurable driving? True. You know, And I think mm -hmm. as we will continue to crowd the streets and the roads, that will go down if we don't make it Absolutely. change. You know? so sure. My, my concern, though, is you know, what if the government then says, well, the other minutes throughout the day that you I, I don't think I'll buy a Mercedes Class S <laughs> for, for my five minutes on, on, on Route 1. Uh, you know, on Easter morning, you know, that's right. <laughs> it's a little expensive for Luca. Luca, I don't know, but yeah. All right, so I have another question here from the uh, audience, which is really interested in understanding where will we see autonomous vehicles first in terms of regions in the world? And I talked with th some of you prior to the panel a little bit about this. Um, for some of you that have followed the news, yesterday uh, David Strickland announced in the United States that uh, the NHTSA is in favor of supporting autonomous vehicle systems, but there still has to be a lot of work to really understand the implications of it. I see other countries in the world being a little bit more um, proactive on this, a little bit more opportunistic. Japan, the prime minister there, has said, yes, we do want to support self-driving vehicles going forward. What regional country do you think will first see autonomous vehicles going forward? Well, and maybe I start with, with Corey. They're already out there. You know, we're, we're talking a lot. It, uh, when you say self-driving vehicles, I think of the full spectrum. And I think a lot of people are still thinking passenger cars. And because we're already doing it. We, we have self-driving vehicles that are being launched now around the world. Um, I, uh, Induct Technologies has uh, Singapore, multiple locations in France, and um, now we're starting in the U.S. So I think the question to me is, you know, for me when I think about it is, where are the applications going to start? And it, it, you know, Josh is working on something really interesting with long haul trucks. We're doing first and last mile. That's a kind of a new mobility solution. We're taking the place of long walks, inefficient shuttles, and long wait times. So those are, are going to be the first applications. I think they're going to be logistics, moving people and supplies. And then incrementally, we'll, we'll reach the consumer vehicles. But would it happen in the U.S. first, you think, or maybe no. in different parts of the world? No, it's going to happen in Japan first, then, then Europe, then the U.S. Interesting. Other perspectives on this, where this will happen first? <laughs> Anybody wants to guess? <laughs> well, you know, I have to say Silicon Valley. Wow. I'm, I'm yes. with you. <laughs> Good. You can clap, but it's You guys will buy the... You know, <laughs> already, help me to help you. Story. Help me to help you. <laughs> No, I know we're almost out of time, unfortunately. Again, we have a ton of questions left, so hopefully we'll be able to actually address some of them in the networking uh, time that we have here afterwards. Um, but I would like to thank all of the panelists here very much for, for bringing uh, your, your expertise with you and for being here tonight. And thank you very much to the audience for being here and submitting great questions. So thanks to all of you.